So again, welcome. I am Reverend Wendy Silvers, and it is a joy and an honor to be here with you. Let's see if Amaryllis is present. Yes, she is. Okay. So Amaryllis. Hello, I'm Reverend Wendy. Hello there, Amaryllis. It is such a joy to have you here. It's a pleasure to be here. What a nice pause and what a profound appeal before that prayer. Um, gosh, if only. And, and also, it is becoming. We are that Congress of Women here today and every day on this campaign. I feel that. It, it really strikes me on this campaign every day how many women are at its core and how many of those women are mothers, either to their own children or um, to to the work that we're doing to others that they that they nurture and, and care for every day of this campaign. And people say to me, how do you do this with kids? I, by the way, have a two-year-old, a five-year-old, and a 15-year-old. Uh, <laughs> a little so, bit of developmental stages going on there. Yeah, um, they're all very busy. And, you know, every time I get asked that, to me, the question is, as a mom, how could I not? Mm -hmm. You know, this is the world they're going to inherit. And I look at yes. them and wonder if they'll, you know, know the freedom that I knew as a child, whether they'll be able to speak their truth or risk, you know, having their passport reclaimed and, and their bank account turned off. Um, and what does that mean for, for human freedom on earth, for nuclear security, for humanity's faring in, in, as we walk into the breach with artificial intelligence, so many crucial issues that when I look at my two-year-old and five-year-old who have no idea about any of this, my 15-year-old's pretty aware of it, but um, how could we not? And that is why we all show up every day, you know, because um, the, the tomorrow that our, our kids deserve is not written. You know, we, we are more powerful than we know. And yeah. ultimately it is... It is on each of us, and I see it every day out there in the field on this campaign, how central um, mothers and fathers, but, you know, people who care for their community, for their family, for their country. Um, we've, we've settled recently on people over politics, um, people before politics and country before party as, as um, a kind of guiding principle for the campaign. And I think it is also a guiding principle for, for parenthood. Um, you know, I was doing my, my five-year-old has extremely curly hair for anyone who has not met her. Her name is Bobcat. She's actually Bobby the fourth, the first girl, Bobby. And <laughs> she's a firecracker. And, mm -hmm. um, and so I'd been up and I'd watched the, the sun begin to creep over the hills and heard the kind of the the birds and then the insects and then my five-year-old all sleepy emerges from her room and she'd gotten something stuck in her hair mm. and it was this shift from solving the the 25 weeks ahead of us to change our country and protect freedom for my children forever to that's not the right hairbrush mom you know i'm gonna be late for school and and it is that ability to shift back and forth that is what leaves me in awe of mothers every day. Just the, the, the balance between being there in spiritual connection with your children and going out into the world and, and working on their behalf so that, you know, what, what they have to inherit is, is worthy of them. Mm, well said, well said. So, so it's so rich. There's so much that you... You said in there, I, I've been working with mom parents for 24 years, and it is probably the highest and the holiest walk to be in the day to day, to be in that, that moment of how do you change the world one child at a time, being so present with them. And the moments are so sacred. So it and it is it is that huge adjustment of going from I'm going to do this for the world oh, I'm doing this for this little <laughs> world and and it reminds me of the saying that 
to the world, you are just a mother, but to your child, you are the world. It's so beautiful and so crucial that we create a world where mothers and fathers can be that present, can can have yes. the security, um, physical security, health security, financial security, um, spiritual space and, and community connection to, to be able to be present in that way. And I think it's one of the great challenges that we face today is just um, such, such a struggle sometimes to make ends meet that time together is, is more and more rare. Grandparents are, you know, still working when they might otherwise be helping to, to take care of the kids and have those bonds. Parents are, are taking on multiple jobs and that sacred time is, is scarcer and scarcer. And meanwhile, the funds that we could be spending to support all of that, um, you know, we're, we're using to buy weapons that we blow up over foreign skies. That's why I, I, I use this word. That's why I love RFK Jr. And I love what you're doing and who you are, because like I shared with you in the email, the depth of your consciousness just burst through your book. I mean, when I read that and I could feel the depth of compassion that you hold and your commitment to peace through nonviolence. Mm. And something I'm curious about is how did you hold on to and how do you hold on to your faith or spirituality in the midst of when you go behind the curtain and you learn what's really going on that the outside world doesn't know about it. it's a whole different layer so how do you navigate that it's so present with me every day of this campaign i feel this extremely palpable sense of protection around mm -hmm. all of us um as we as we walk a really righteous path and and do something that i think is is a part of the calling and, and, and reason that many of us are here. Um, and the, the level of corruption and attack that we face, um, in many ways for me, it only draws a starker contrast, you know, why, why it is that we are here, why we're doing what we're doing and that ultimately you know, light and life will win. Mm -hmm. And, yeah. uh, you know, this is, I wrote about this on Easter, but my, my daughter has an Easter name, Zoe Victoria, which means life is victorious. And I've seen that every step with small challenges and the much larger challenges um, of this campaign is that when we tell the truth, when we do the right thing, even if it's not strategically, you know, sound, at least in the immediate mm -hmm. practical sense, mm -hmm. uh, it, it turns out to, uh, to be a greater gift than if we had done the cynical thing. And that is a, is a daily church for me yeah. to witness. Um, I, I, I haven't been to church as often as I, I used to I've my entire life gone, gone every Sunday. I, I shared with you, Reverend, one day that um, I always thought I would go to seminary one day and, and maybe I will still go to seminary one day. Um, but my undergraduate degree was, was in theology and I, I had hoped to, um, to go straight into to service after that. Um, and 9-11 and shifted my course but increasingly I'm aware of how many ministries there are in the world, yes. how, how many of us are sent to serve one another outside of the four walls of a place of worship, um, you know, wherever, wherever many are gathered, 
or even two. Uh, and here we are many. So I, I sense it every day. I think there is, um, there has been a disconnect for a long time for a lot of people where you go, and it was Garrison Keeler who used to say, you're, uh, you are no more a Christian because you go to church on Sunday than I am a car because I sleep in my garage. Um, <laughs> and, I, you know, there, for a long time, I think many people have felt uh, more and more of a kind of separation between their their daily life in in uh, this country, especially with lockdowns and other others, and their spiritual life. And this journey, in every way, the the connections with others who who have set all material gain aside, many you know gave up advancement in their career, you know, put everything on hold to come and, and um, give of their time uh, on this campaign, um, those connections, and then also watching the world um, listen to what Bobby has to say. I think there is a, there's a vibration, you know, with my kids, I, I sometimes I play with tuning forks, you know, where you hit the tuning fork and you can hold it to their chest or, mm -hmm. and I think when Bobby speaks, and this is a quality that Nicole shares, there is a, a, a vibrational quality to truth speaking that so many in this country have forgotten and forgotten for so long that they don't even remember that there was something to forget mm -hmm. until they hear it. And then mm -hmm. it's just an automatic awakening. It's uh, th There's something really primal about it. And seeing that awakening to spirit, to connection, to healing, to seeing ourselves in one another, you know, restoring health to our country, to our, um, to our bodies and to our spirits, to our communities, that, that has really been a spiritual journey. And it, it feels like kind of a homecoming to a, to a spiritual, uh, to a spiritual study or, or career, even without going to seminary. Uh, so as you are Reverend Wendy, you know, I just, I think we, we're each called to serve in different ways. And I know many, many have been called to serve in this campaign. Oh, absolutely. Yes, yes. And, and, and I think that there are very many ministries and it is the opportunity to be of service and what it, what, what, what propels you and I and I know what pro propels you and many of us, most of us on this campaign is the opportunity for a, for peace and love and truth in the way that RFK Jr. holds that. And each of the people that are engaged, yourself and the others that are engaged in the campaign, I, I think of them as emissaries, mm -hmm. of emissaries of light, emissaries of peace, emissaries of truth that have just shown, you know, just devoted to this. And, I, and I've said on the Sunday prayer circle, I've often said that, that this is, it's almost more than a, than a presidential campaign. It feels like a movement mm. that there's something, I mean, for sure it is a presidential campaign and it feels like there's something that is seeking expression through this that is, more than a campaign. So it's really profound, really profound. I, I sense that ev every day out there and I, 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 much of it is around the nurturing, the healing, the bringing through of, uh, of health for our children, which has been such a, a leading principle for us and what that means you know, when we, when we sow violence abroad, of course, mm -hmm. we then sow violence at home um, and even internally uh, in our communities and, and increasingly we're losing even years of life expectancy to these, to these chronic illnesses and even deaths of despair from fentanyl and suicide and mm -hmm. so much isolation in our country. And as women, as mothers, as, uh, as, um, leaders in this campaign, that's one of the things that is most crucial for us to, to step up and name and invite people to share their experiences about because um, it, it, the, 
the shift away from um, valuing our our own time with family, our own um, spiritual fulfillment, our own connection to community as much or or more than um, you know the the material things that we've had. Maybe it began to fade in in the eighties, uh, greed is good era, but yes. it it truly reached fever pitch, uh, and, and has sort of metastasized into such divisiveness uh, that that it's actually outward facing now. And um, we we hear the yearning to come back together, and I think as you say, something is seeking expression. And we are we are propelled forward by it. Absolutely, amen, amen, amen. I I have I'm inspired and invigorated by this campaign and by RFK Jr. because what he is speaking about and Nicole are family values, but not family values that come from a have to. Mm -hmm. or you should, but from this very organic place of my language, who am I, why am I here, what am I here to share, and when? So these, these questions are, it's like a deep inquiry. And I know that Nicole is here with us. And I would love to add her to our round table because there's some questions I would love to ask both of you. So I'm going to just add her to, to, our, um, to our round table right here. Hi. Hi, Nicole. Hi, Nicole. Hi, it's me. an honor to, to be here with you both. Thank you for for I know you were flying in and your arms must be tired, just really bad joke, but well, <laughs> welcome. I'm gonna just share with everybody um, a little bit about you and they can go to the bio, um, they can go to the website and read your bio, but uh, it's so funny. You're sitting here and I'm talking about you the third person, right? Like I did with Amarillo, so bear with me. Uh, Nicole Shanahan is an attorney and tech entrepreneur in the San Francisco Bay Area. Her work on behalf of honest governance, racial equality, regenerative agriculture, and children's and maternal health has put her at the forefront of many of the country's most urgent needs. Healthy planet, healthy humans is how Nicole describes the through line of her career which has long been centered around people, health, and the environment. She is the founder and president of BIA Echo Foundation. Have I said that right? Is it BIA or BIA? BIA? Okay. Yeah, A private know. foundation that invests in innovative change makers who are tackling some of the world's greatest challenges. Reproductive equality and longevity, criminal justice reform, a healthy and livable planet, and more. Early in her career, Nicole founded and was CEO of Clear Access IP, a patent management company utilizing AI and automation to support the innovation economy. She is a fellow at Stanford Law School's CodeX, where she launched a multidisciplinary criminal justice reform effort with the San Francisco District Attorney Office that inspired a powerful partnership with the Stanford Computation Policy Lab, now at Harvard. Her work, particularly building innovative algor algorithmic tools to guide high stakes decisions, leverages advancements in data science that allows for policy impact to be studied at unprecedented scale. Among other achievements, Nicole is the recipient of the Cali Excellence for the Future Award and Santa Clara Law School's Young Alumni Rising Star Award. She's been recognized as a top 50 femtech healthcare influencer and longevity leader and a San Francisco Business Times 40 Under 40 leader for her work 
as a trailblazer running organizations at the forefront of ethics in AI and access for justice through justice. She has long been committed to issues at the intersection of tech, law, and justice, and regularly helps facilitate high-level forums with global leaders, including Stanford Law's Future Law Conference, and she's a mama. And I heard you on the interview with Sage Steele. Yeah. And I felt like you were speaking my heart about the power of the mama in more positions of, of power and elected placements and how you feel that if moms are in these positions, we'll have more peace in the world. Mm. Yeah. Well, first, thank you so much, uh, Reverend, for having me and Amaryllis. I just love getting a chance to hear you speak. It's, um, you know, it's it's been an opportunity to make a new friend um, mm. joining this campaign. And, you know, you've been working so hard with such incredible laser focus talent and execution and your leadership has made everyone who's core in this um, feel confident and unafraid. Um, and so I'm so grateful to be here today with all of you. Um, wonderful, wonderful people. I've been reading the comments. They're so nice. I, I'm so used to reading, <laughs> you know, threads sometimes full of anger and hate <laughs> and, and to be here. I my whole system is relaxed. So thank you for inviting me and having me. Absolutely. Um, Oh, we love you so much. I, I just have to say, I know we, I, I want to hear everything that you're going to say, Nicole, but I have to say to everybody here, it has been such a blessing of this campaign to come to know Nicole and to build our friendship, to also envision this country with the leadership of Bobby and Nicole, these mm -hmm. two authentic, deeply mm -hmm. grounded healers and truth speakers who have made decisions out of authenticity, never with the calculation that any of it would lead to this calling. And that of course is why they are they are the the leaders that we need, not the leaders who seek power, but but those who whose followers seek to put them there. And um I'm just I'm so grateful to you, Nicole, from our very first Zoom conversation. Oh, I've been blown away and uh, we're very, very lucky to have you. Absolutely. I heard your speech in Oakland and I was moved to tears when your announcement was made and your mom was literally like, I would say like two people away from me and I wanted to hug her, watching oh. her watch you. And yeah. I, was, I have the, like, I have the goosebumps. Just oh. your, your humility and your uh, accessibility and your genuine, like I just, I just kept, I walked away. I was like, oh my God, what a perfect choice just to, you know, to take on the mantle of vice president. And every Sunday at 5 p.m. Pacific time, I lead a prayer circle for RFK Jr. and you and the campaign. And, and so to just watch, you know, the love that just, you know, in all the comment boxes, it's this unbelievable, it's like a love fest that yeah. just keeps happening. Do you feel that, and this is a question for both of you, do you feel that your mother influenced you in terms of how you mother and your spiritual practice? Yeah, Amaryllis. Oh, pl please. I feel like I've talked a lot here. Um, But yes, I mean, so much that <laughs> sometimes I go, oh, I'm becoming my mother. Um, which I think we've all, <laughs> yes, <laughs> we all have that experience. I have a little bit of that going on. Um, <laughs> but in my case, I'm, I, that, I'm very blessed and lucky if that should ever be the case and I ever should get to become my mother. Um, you know, she's, she's English and a, a, a poet and a classicist and um it, the one thing that I will say for here is that 
she read us so many Greek myths and legends when I was little. And um, one of the lessons from, from all of those stories is that the obstacle is always put in the path of the hero to give them something they need to succeed in the end, to teach them the lessons they need to, to accomplish the mission that the gods have put before them. And, you know, whether it's the practical challenges of ballot access or it's the, the spiritual challenges of, you know, even as Nicole described, sometimes reading comment threads is rough. Um, certainly reading media that is, is so, you know, intentionally calculated as, as attacks, but each and every one of those obstacles, what I've found is that as, as Bobby and Nicole lead our re responding to these things with such grace and the mm -hmm. campaign follows suit mm -hmm. and doesn't get down in the mud and holds this gracious space with the country and with one another, and even with those who, who attack us, um, you know, I think those obstacles do turn into, um, you know, they open the gates and, and allow, allow others to see the potential here the way that we do. Um, so that that's the lesson that I draw from my mom today, but also just utter devotion. She was, is such an incredible mom, just complete awesome. presence and devotion. Um, and while I'm, it's hard until November, I wish I could put bricks on my kids' heads. They're getting so big so quickly, but, um, <laughs> but, but um, yeah, I, I, I certainly aspire to her example. My mom, it's really funny. My mom um, would always say she wasn't, you, you know, always the warmest physically because um, of how she was raised. She was raised during the communist revolution mm -hmm. in China. And as a result of that, that really impacted her in many ways. Um, but she showed her love through food. And mm -hmm. she would always say, you know, the three pillars of success are health, happiness, and then being in control of oneself. Mm -hmm. I don't know where she got that from, but it's uh, it's always how she would prioritize wellness. Is it's your physical health first, which was typically food, and then um, happiness, joy, and and then you know if and then you can be in control of oneself, and then you can function in the world. And it's it's funny that that food was her way of showing love because um, putting regenerative agriculture, I, I found myself in regenerative agriculture and it has transcended into every other field of work mm -hmm. that I've undertaken. Um, so I look at climate and I look at it and, and ecosystems and sustainability and regenerative agriculture was the only category that fit all of the boxes and human health. And then women's reproductive health, it goes mm -hmm. back to the food we're eating and the water we're consuming. And then even criminal justice reform, I realize it comes back to the sense of abundance and connection to the land and nourishment of one's communities. And those are the building blocks of getting out of poverty. And once you solve for poverty, you cut off, you know, this, this life that is desperate that leads to a life of crime. Yes. And, um, so my mom is fully responsible for that. And, and to, to show love through food is, is what she taught me. And, and that's a huge part of what Bobby believes in too, this whole team mm -hmm. uh, and the work as well. Yes, yes, well said both. Isn't it amazing how our, our mothers influence us? You know, there's an, there's an old saying, people that do family constellation work, I, I, I spoke with somebody and your your in your grandmother are your eggs for your children. Mm -hmm. like, it's just so remarkable. And when you do healing work, I know Nicole, you talked about the Hoffman Institute. When you do healing work, I believe you heal seven generations in front of you and seven generations behind. Wow. And you get to be that citadel that changes things it's like you're that person that changes the legacy mm -hmm. so it's remarkable what you both are doing and thank you for the regenerative farming thank you I mean I think about 
how in, like the soil, the seeds, and it's so distressing to think about what um, has to happen to our soil and the seeds and the GMO and 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 all of all of that and what our children inherit. We create the world our children inherit. So how amazing that you are doing what you are doing that we get to step forward in a different way. Yeah. Yeah. And fertility has been a huge theme of, of my work as well. And um an unintended you know, women's reproductive health and thinking about fertility and soil is about the fertility of our mama earth. Yes. And, uh, and making sure that capacity isn't lost because of misguided, um, greed and desires to control. And mm -hmm. that's been a theme that has come up a lot in my life is, um, seeing how, how there's this tendency towards this mechanistic control over nature and control over fertility. I, I realize this is nothing new control over women's fertility has been, you know, around for cent I mean, as, as long as human history, likely it's such a powerful force and, um, and, and, something, someone said something to me at a farmer's market in Hawaii a few months ago. She said to me, just, this was within the first three sentences of having an exchange. She said, they're taking away our fertility to sell it back to us. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I felt, um, I was kind of blown away. I mean, this was a, a, a vendor at at the farmer's market. And it was such a powerful statement that I keep hearing over and over again. And, and that unfortunately I've seen over and over again. Um, and it's, it's, it's very troubling. And I think that it represents a larger theme that we see in, in what has been called science. Um, and the thing is, is I love science, but there's two categories of science. There's the control and engineering of nature. And then there's the working with the forces of nature and the science of nature. And so th this differentiation is something that I also see embodied very deeply in this campaign, that this is a force on behalf of, of working it, in partnership with nature. Um, and, and a recognition that control of nature will oftentimes make us sick if, if we put that control, that need to possess first mm -hmm. um, and, and to um, dominate, have dominion over nature. It will always lead us um, into catastrophe. Mm. Wow, that's so well said. I, and I, I feel like we have uh, everybody's responding to, they take away our fertility so they can sell it back to us. And uh, I received a question um, last night about the eons of patriarchy and, and dismantling, I think, reforming and transforming it. And certainly when you talk about um, what you experienced in the CIA and the wars, and then Nicole, what you're talking about in terms of regenerative farming and fertility, um, what is your approach? How do you bring your awareness to that and hold it in a, in a holy place? Mm. Hey. That's a, that's a big question. I, <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Amrila, do you have an answer? <laughs> well, I, I mean, the I too responded so strongly to to what you just said, Nicole, taking fertility to sell it back to us, because you know one of the themes that we come across in so many ways in the camp in this campaign is the tension between the the abundance and self-sufficiency that nature and spirit 
has gifted each of us that is our birthright here as earthlings as beings um that that we are provided for that we have self-knowledge that when we listen quietly you know our purpose and and so much guidance is clear and and the same is true of health and healing and sunshine and so exercise you know these these things that are free um that that are gifted from spirit and from one another um that are so core to our self-sufficiency and our empowerment and and one of the the challenges that that we face is with corporate capture is that self-sufficiency you know health gifted through through the free freely available gifts of of nature and spirit it do, does not a business model make my friends mm -hmm. and so there is a there is a taking away of a, a, a forgetting a forgetting of the power we have to heal one another to uh to grow our own food um to capture, you know, Bobby talks a lot about um, the the shifting the rights to be able to have solar panels that you know where you're selling energy back to the grid. This idea that that you know power to the people. We were joking, but that everything does not need to be pulled away and then sold back to us. Fertility yeah. is you know such a dramatic example, but. I, to, to me, that is a very holy endeavor to come back to your question, Reverend Wendy, is, is this sense of honoring the sacred gifts that we're given by recognizing them. It's, it's a kind of remembering um, that I'm, I'm seeing happen. Bobby, Nicole, all of us, this movement is, is a part of it, but, and it's a broader remembering, I think that through, through the kind of sudden um, exponential explosion of industrialization and uh, chemical additives and plastics. And, you know, the, we can do anything better by making it synthetic, um, <laughs> you know, over, over many decades that, that kind of that breathlessness is subsiding and the 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 long-term costs to all mm -hmm. of us um in terms of health and community connection and resilience and self-reliance and and the true sense of empowerment that makes us good parents makes mm -hmm. us good citizens mm -hmm. um once you yield that power you know that then the government or or the corporations or any power that be, you know, once you've yielded your power, it, it, it's it's a long walk back. And um, yeah. it, it's really beautiful to see people standing up and reclaiming it. Oh, yes. Yes. Like the common ground, the, that film. Yeah. So much bringing so much awareness. I, I believe that when we have awareness, we can make different choices. Yes. And yeah. then with what your your with your platform, Nicole, being mm -hmm. able to, it's it's you know what it reminds me of, you know, as a parent, we want to allow we want to. It's almost like that very ancient saying about, do I teach do I teach uh, somebody to fish or do I give them fish? It's mm -hmm. like the I thought Jesus said that you know eons and eons ago. But it's it's really a universal teaching. And mm -hmm. as moms, do we do we give this to our children or do we help them help them develop, cultivate something within them that allows them to activate that? Do you do that with your children? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, so my my daughter's five and a half, and she's been delayed in many ways. Um, and while she has an autism diagnosis, I kind of find that irrelevant. I focus on the chronic diseases that we're working on overcoming. Yes. So for us, overcoming stuff is like a moment to moment experience. Um. And, and for her, you know, for her, it's really a sense of regulating within her space. Mm -hmm. 
and she is regulated. She can climb a tree. She can jump, you know, five feet in the air on her trampoline. She taught herself how to swim at two and a half years of age. Um, and in spite of not being able to communicate with language, and um, she has a almost mermaid like curiosity with the world um, where, you know, water makes sense to her, but people don't. And yeah, I can relate to that. <laughs> yeah, I, you know, I think she's on something. I once had someone say to me, well, yeah, no wonder she's like not wanting to put all that effort into speaking and communicating when she can just go swim like a fish. Um, because, you know, an intelligent mind in this day and age would say, you know, spend your time doing the thing that brings you joy. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I, and she is an intelligent mind and she's taught me, um, you know, how to redefine intelligence in my own life, because I had a very different perception of intelligence before mm -hmm. she taught me that intelligence sometimes states, you know, go do the thing that brings you joy um, mm -hmm. over, you know, the other thing that you think you should be doing follow the thing that releases your spirit um Beautiful. moment of just ease and um dance with the senses um because yeah. she has sensory integration issues but I see her dancing with her senses and playing with her senses and so allowing her to be herself has been I, like I don't even like using the word allow like I, I think giving her that space and um, restraining myself from behaving in a way that I think mothers are supposed to behave, but just, you know, standing back and, and not intruding in her process. Mm, that's beautiful. It's really remarkable, isn't it? The things that sometimes may bring us to our knees and end up holding within them some of the most incredible um, nuggets of compassion and wisdom and expansion. It's, it's uh, remarkable. That's so very beautiful. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Amaryllis. You know, my 15 year old Zoe, um, her, her dad stayed in the service a long a, a, a lot longer than I, I did. Um, and so he went back to combat zones, um, when she was two and I left and started the company that you described and, and, and had kind of a little healing cottage with her, um, by, by the, the seaside in Carpinteria, mm -hmm. which is a kind of vibey old cool beach town in California and just really healed and cur curled into her and, and, and her, me, and we, we were just the two of us peas in a pod for, you know, 10, 10 years. And, um, and she takes on, she, she's an incredibly deep feeling soul. Um, and when she, she came to be close to her dad again, when he finally came back, he'd been through, a few uh sort of two two IEDs and and some other physical trauma and was okay but had a, a TBI a traumatic brain injury um and it has slowly grown into more and more um PTSD paranoia psychosis um that is incredibly scary uh, for her. And to me, you know, I talk with her about it a lot. There are 2 million, just over two, two and a half, 2.15 million American children who had, um, a parent deployed to Iraq or Afghanistan. And mm. it is a, it is this silent war that all of these children are mm. still going through day after day in their homes that they don't tell their teachers about and they don't tell their friends about watching yeah. the aftermath of trauma play out. And in fact, you know, Dean, so his dad, uh, uh, his dad, when he was a child, 
had been in Vietnam and mm. there, there was a kind of a, a multi-generational passage of that. You know, he tells a story of there being a bat in, in the house and his mom was, his mom was screaming because there was a bat in the house and his dad went and got a tennis racket and a screwdriver and held the bat down to the wall with a tennis racket and st stabbed it with a screwdriver. And then there was, you know, <sighs> and that, and, and kind of referenced that, 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 you know, kind of the, this is what I learned out there, son, kind of a thing. And to me, it is this, it, the horrors of war are self-evident, certainly to anyone who's ever spent a day in one, but I think to most of us, mm -hmm. the, mm -hmm. the aftermath and this deep, deep, um, multi-generational, but certainly rest of your life you know, Dean was a National Geographic photographer, tall, willowy, quiet poet, you know, mm -hmm. and, and these things, these things change you and they change the society that you come home to and they change the way that you parent and the way that you, you, you trust and the way that you yeah. communicate with the world and all of those things, you know, as RFK Senior talks about the ripples of hope that spread and combine to sweep down the mightiest walls of oppression and the same is true of the of the valleys you know and and the, those two emanate out from us when we're wounded and when we bring that kind of trauma and division home and so many of children are on the front lines of it and, and nobody really even knows and so as we think about you know another activation somewhere else in the world some other pursuit of of a, an agenda where we are imposing our will um, through violence. I, I, Zoe is such a, a, a pole star for me in watching her carry on her sweet 15 year old shoulders, mm. all of, of the caretaking around her dad, bringing him groceries because it's hard for him to, to kind of be out and about um, and, and how many children are, are coping with that. And, God, if I am here for any reason, it's to stop another mm -hmm. kid having a parent come home and, yeah. and have to have a parent go in the first place. Yeah. yeah. Wow. That is so moving what each of you shared. It's just about taking a breath and taking that in this, this particular gathering is about mom's prayer and politics mm -hmm. and the power of the mother, that energy to create a better world for our children, how each and all of us are called or compelled by different, different influences, but yet meeting at that same place to wanting a better world, to wanting more opportunity. It's 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 so beautiful. Is that your daughter? Yeah. Oh, Zoe. Oh, this is Bobcat. Oh, Bobcat. Uh, hi, Bobcat. Hi, Bobcat. It's so good hi, to see everyone. you. Oh. <laughs> Bobcat just came home from school. Yeah. We're talking about being mamas. Yeah. Yes. Um. Ooh, okay. I'm gonna come in and... Nicole, I, I love how you were so specific about the sacred time that you spend with Echo. Your daughter's name is Echo, correct? Yeah, yeah. And 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 just making that, like having Bobcat come in while we're talking mm -hmm. about this very topic and then thinking and reflecting upon how you made a declaration that your time with Echo is sacred, is that translates, you know, you don't have to, to speak the words. Like one of the, one of my inquiries was, um, how can we keep the tradition of a mother's prayer alive at this time, especially when you're working on a campaign? Right. Mm -hmm. And you're, you're, you're both articulating exactly the way that you do that. 
And if there's anything else you would like to add about your prayer for your children, and I believe a mother's heart, unless unless she's mentally incapable or emotionally incapable, not only cares for the children in front of her, but all the children. Okay, you can show them your stuff. <laughs> this is Bobcat. This is another Bobcat. <laughs> I love that. Oh, I love Bobcat. Oh, um, yeah, the kids that I've been meeting on the campaign trail have been a constant reminder for why we can't give up and we can't let any of the hate or the harassment impact us I mean we can feel it we can understand it we can be hurt by it but then we gotta put it together and keep going mm -hmm. um the prayer that I have for this campaign is the prayer of a, a mother who is so I see the children of this nation and I want them to have every resource to clean water. I want them to have every resource to full bellies that feel good. You know that feeling when you just eat really, really good food? Yes. Bobcat, you know that feeling when you eat something yummy? <laughs> and you're just, oh, that was great. Um, so it, it really is the... the you know, thinking about the sensory experience of health. Mm -hmm. I want our children to have all of their senses to experience all of life. That is my prayer for this nation. Mm. Amen. Uh -huh. mm. yeah. Oh. yeah, I mean, they, they are so present and such teachers and i think we um we're talking about you and other kids me <laughs> you know i think we've <laughs> we've started to think of of them as you know beings to to be warehoused in school while parents go to work so everybody can grow the gdp and they can just be kind of taken care of until they get out to do their own business when they're old enough to to bring in the bacon and you know it just there's there's such um there's there's such majestic learnings to 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 share with one another and i the the education system as a kind of um i mean day daycare or a, a kind of a, a a housing of kids while while we work is is so <laughs> symptomatic of it's uh, so turn. many are my it's turn. your turn here yeah um of <laughs> the same thing we do with you know with the, the uh, industrialized prison system in this country and oh yes the disposability yeah. of of plastics but also uh, um, of people and um and i think <laughs> seeing one another as our children <laughs> not just our own children but everyone hey. will solve that hi there's coffee on this table. Yeah, um, but it, I, I'm gonna, go, I'm going to, to, um, Mama, having said that, go and spend some talk. time with I, these little ones because they just got over at school. Cassius is inside. Absolutely. Yeah, they are all here thank too. you. Hey, thank you for being here, Amaryllis, and thank you, Bobcat. It's been a joy to see you again. <laughs> my that prayer is to be with all of you yeah. every step of this journey including yeah. on january 20th where we will gather you know in dc you know uh, to move into this next chapter yes you know they know you me. say hi yes hi. Uh, <laughs> all right send them all right bye-bye thank bye, you so everybody. much bye, bye. 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 <laughs> That is so sweet. <laughs> I know that it just makes my heart so happy to see the children and to see. I I know you shared something recently, and I think it, Echo was there. I think 
you were playing with her or doing something and it's just like this is this is life this is what it looks like mm -hmm. to be um, a vice president this is what it looks like to be a mom who who is so devoted to her calling because clearly you're answering a calling yeah it, it very much is that I was just at a maternal home in, uh, where were we, in Houston, where these were moms and children who are really, really suffering in our country. And there was this little boy running around, his name is Justice, and he's one years old. And he had a shine and a light to him. And, you know, I couldn't help but just want to play and he just <laughs> wanted to play and we're running around the maternity house and he's you know he, I was wearing a dress and he's like hiding around the dress and, mm. and it was just it was this moment of realizing that um I don't have to be a plastic politician and that what the nation needs right now is absolutely no more plastic politicians or we don't need to ask our women to sacrifice their motherhood um, mm. to be a caricature or to be a um, cold version of something to show that they're somehow more competent at the work. Mm. Um, that's been, a, I, I believe, just an unfortunate outcome of us um, separating our who we are in order to do these jobs. And I, you know, we've have these now politicians like Diane Feinstein, they're not enjoying being grandmothers because they get stuck in these political parties that keep pushing them through to literally their final breath. Um, what country thinks that's how we should be living? And um, that's the country that we're in at this moment, but we are changing that and we're leading by example every single day. Um, mm. It's, uh, it, it is it is long overdue. And, um, and I think that we will, by doing this, you know, Amaryllis, does it so gracefully, yes. you know, you come in, you come out and your, your force as a motherhood is the force that you bring to your job and the patience that you learn as a, as a mother and the understanding that you learn as a mother is what you bring to this job because um, that's the relationship we have to, to progress in order to um, overcome this great division. Oh, beautiful. Thank you. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. That is what a wonderful uh, scaffolding you just presented for a way of being to transform politics as usual, to transform an outdated structure. Yeah. And, and the elders are, you know, wisdom keepers. This is how society had been for many, many, many generations. Yeah. Um, and matriarchs mm -hmm. were viewed as incredibly powerful and wise in our society for their ability to lead um, their community and prioritize um, all of the foundations, the, the, the elemental features that allow for their communities to have abundance. Um, and our country right now has that abundance. It's just not finding that matriarchal um, direction mm. um, and, and pri prioritiz pri prioritizing of, of that, you know, you said scaffolding, but of the scaffolding of abundance. Yes. Uh, it's mis directed in pieces of it right now and and um the coherence that is possible again i don't think it's that far out of reach at all no and and i i often think that when 
when we start to hear certain things, it's like this. It, it's it's like so I'm go, I'm gonna just widen the lens and get a little woo here, but like the it's like the trees communicate to you know across the land. They 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 reveal and communicate how you know how we're doing, how the how the earth is doing, and how how everything is going. And when you when you when I hear what you're saying, it's this through line that I believe that's why the people that are drawn to you and RFK Jr. are part of, I don't know if you were online when I was saying to Amaryllis that I feel like this is a presidential campaign and more. I feel mm -hmm. like it's, it's in a movement of awakening where people want what you're talking about. Moms want to, most moms want to be with their children and do something that fulfills them, not have to choose and dads too. I don't think that dads want to be away from their families all the time. Mm -hmm. And so you and RFK Jr. are offering to people the opportunity to reclaim themselves and to have families that feel nurtured and loved and to have opportunities. I mean, the basics that you're talking about to have clean soil. I mean, it's so fascinating, right? Because RFK Jr. feels the same way and he talks about clean water, clean soil, clean seeds, the, the reproduction, you know, the reproductive system and fertility. And the, I mean, all of these, these, I think of them as spokes on the wheel, but in the center, what you're speaking about is the wholeness that's available to people. Yeah. Amen to that. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. And um I, you know, I really appreciate this. I, I hadn't been um on one of these before and I hope you do it more often. Maybe we, you know, there's five and a half more months uh left yeah. of the campaign and um you know, I, every time I get on stage, sometimes I wonder if I should open with a prayer or invocation. <laughs> um, and it's, it's a very powerful thing. Bobby does it naturally. He really does invoke spirit when he's out there on stage. And, and, and we all, we all feel it. He's tapping into something that inspires us. So it's a, but but if you want to do this again, I'd be more than happy to join. I want you to talk. Oh, I, I'm <laughs> yes. It is a yes, a whole full yes, absolutely. Yes, thank you, thank you for being here. And um, would you would you like me to close out with a prayer, or would you like to speak a word of prayer? Um, I I would love to hear from you, Reverend Wendy. Okay. This is my first time, and I'd I'd love to hear. Okay. From you. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you for being here. Thank you for all you shared. Thank you for your yes. Mm -hmm. Thank you for bringing, um, I feel emotional when I, I hear it because you are, you yes. have such a beautiful heart. I really am getting emotional. And that is what was communicated when, when, when Bobby announced you as the VP pick, I felt your heart. I don't think I've been with somebody who was so genuine and so heartfelt and so brilliant and beautiful. I was like, this, this woman's amazing and so committed to motherhood. So, and to all of the, all of God's creatures. So thank you. Thank you. And I'll, I'll say a prayer of thanks as well um, to, to everyone who's given me a chance um, who was able to see past some of the media stuff out there and um, understand that I've gone through a personal transformation as well to arrive to this moment. Um, your yeah. grace as a community has been overwhelming and um, kindness uh, and then everyone's courage for giving also politics another chance mm -hmm. for everyone that's given up on politics. It's, uh, you know, we're all taking a step out there and, and Reverend Wendy, thank you for this. Oh, yeah. 
It's my really my joy, my honor, truly. And I'll just uh, I'll say uh, a a quick I'll close it out with uh, my the way that that I hold space. <sighs> and so I just invite you to close your eyes and bring your awareness into your heart. Mm. And that's my dog who is <laughs> who's going to join us in prayer <laughs> because he wants to eat. <laughs> My heart is just overflowing with gratitude and thankfulness for the opportunity to be here this day, this moment with Nicole Shanahan and Amaryllis Kennedy. How grateful I am for the way in which God shows up, this generating, organizing divine presence that is called by so many names in so many different languages mm -hmm. and answers to them all. So I, mm -hmm. I honor in the name of all that is holy. I bless Nicole. I bless her for her willingness. I bless her for her yes. I bless her for her motherhood, for her womanhood. I bless her mm -hmm. for her sisterhood. I bless her as she goes forth as a representative, taking on the mantle of vice president, answering the call on her soul to be this representative in this way, to bring heart and consciousness into politics. I bless her beloved Jacob. I bless her daughter Echo. I bless each and every experience that she has with every single person with whom she interacts. I bless her business and I bless her business of living. I bless her mom. I bless her siblings. I bless every single aspect of her life, just calling forth peace and peace of mind, calling forth beauty and love and wisdom and generosity. I call forth the absolute surrounding of Nicole and her family, knowing she is divinely guided, led, protected, directed, sustained and maintained by this infinite love intelligence that so loved itself that it recreated itself and calls itself by her name. So I know that Nicole walks in the direction of her bliss, that she is guided from on high, absolutely held in the embrace of this divine presence. And as I know this for Nicole, I know this for Bobby, that right where Bobby is, God is, good is, peace is, love is, that as he continues to walk this walk, as they both continue to walk this walk, toward being sworn in, toward the Oval Office, toward terms of presidency and vice presidency, that Bobby is also held in the embrace of this divine presence, that he too is divinely guided, guarded, protected, directed, sustained, and maintained by God, by this presence. And that as each and both of them, Nicole and Bobby, walk forward through all of their rallies and independent things and all of the things, all of the details that they handle in their personal lives and professional lives and political lives, that there is a synergy, there's a seamlessness to all that they do and that they that they dwell in the secret sacred place of the most high good the most high god the most high love that whether or not secret service is available sacred service is available and they are held so i i bless Gavin De Becker, and for all the service that he provides. I bless Cheryl, I bless all of their families. I bless the team. Every single detail and aspect that this team handles is just absolutely precise and beautiful and wondrous and held, held so high. There is a frequency of love. I and life always. So I know that presidency and vice president and beautiful and every person that is here today and every person that shows up to donate, to volunteer. I know that the great, grand, and glorious expression through this camp, and it goes for is made manifest. And knowing that this is so, I say, allow that to be. Saying, and so it is. Amen. Amen. Thank you.
Thank you. Thank you for being here.